Author event. Washington Post Associate Editor Steve Luxenberg. Separate. The story of Plessy versus Ferguson and America's journey from slavery to segregation. Uh, so I'm a Detroit native. Uh, I wrote a first book. I just happened to have a copy of it called Annie's Ghost. Some people may know of it. It was the great Michigan read in 2013 and 14. Uh, it's about a family secret in my own family. Fortunately, the book I'm about to talk about tonight does not have any of my family secrets because I blew it all in the first book. Uh, I went to school in, in, uh, in Henry Ford High School in, in the city, if any of you are from Detroit. I uh, left to go to college, went off to Baltimore to become a reporter at the Baltimore Sun. And then in 1985, after 11 years at the Sun, I went to the Washington Post, where I've been ever since. I'm an associate editor of the Post, although I have a perfect arrangement right now. I'm on leave writing this book and promoting it. I do no work, and they pay me no money. It's a perfect arrangement. <laughs> uh, I also have a TV credit to my, to my name. How many of you have ever seen the TV show The Wire? on HBO, it was, you know, it's, a, it's the classic show about cops and courts and corruption in the, my home city of Baltimore. Now, when this show was running, we didn't have the additional uh, description that our president has given us recently when he called Baltimore a rat-infested, rodent-infested city of Baltimore, and that's how I identify myself now. I'm from the rat-infested, yeah. Uh, so The Wire. So I happen to have the distinction of having hired the creator of The Wire into his first newspaper job. His name is David Simon. He's also done shows like Treme and currently running The Deuce about the porn industry in New York. I don't know where he went wrong after I hired him, but there you have it. And he rewarded me and other people he worked with at The Sun by giving us bit parts on The Wire, usually extra parts where you don't speak. Uh, and sometimes even naming a character after you, as he did with me. And I wasn't worried about this, particularly, uh, until he sent me an email. I don't know what possessed him, but he said, I just want you to know that when you see the character who has your name but will never, will never say his name during the show, I don't think you're as mealy-mouthed as that guy. <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, I wasn't worried. Now I'm worried. <laughs> So, the, and, and the other thing about The Wire is that how many of you are either lawyers or want to be lawyers? Okay, well, here's the future that's waiting if you want to be a lawyer. Here's what the lawyers, my contact. So, The Wire required me to sign a release that said, I gave them permission, I just signed a release for recording this tonight, uh, in, uh, allowing them to use my name anywhere in the universe. Not the world, the universe. I guess that the wire is seen on Mars or Venus or something. So I signed it, but I added a, a word. I put the word known, K-N-O-W-N, in front of universe. So I gave them the rights to use my, my name in the known universe. So thought nothing of it. Two weeks later, I got a call from HBO. Why did you modify our agreement? <laughs> so I was ready. I said, I have no problem giving you the rights to the known universe, but the unknown universe is still mine. And fortunately, he did not make me re-sign a new agreement without the word known. So would you like me to reenact my, my three seconds on the wire for you? Of course. Of course. So the scene is, it's, it's season five, episode three. It's all about the newspaper industry's role in Baltimore. And there is a scene where the editor is standing on a chair, I'm not going to do it, talking to the whole newsroom and saying, we have to do more with less. We're going to close some foreign bureaus. We're going to do away with our domestic bureaus in Chicago and elsewhere. And uh, we have to downsize and make the staff smaller. Here's my, here's my reaction. <laughs> That's all it was. But because David Simon put me squarely behind the main actors in the scene, everywhere I've traveled, people say, you are on the wire. <laughs> Nobody asked me about my journalism, just my three seconds on the wire. All right, so that's my, that's my biography. So I'm going to talk about um, the most infamous Supreme Court case that nobody knows anything about. Now, everybody here probably knows about Plessy versus Ferguson because you know that it's the separate but equal case, right? 1896, Supreme Court said separate but equal was OK. It lasted until 1954 
when the Supreme Court overturned it with Brown versus Board of Education. And while they didn't say we're overturning it, they essentially overturned it by saying that separate was inherently unequal. So you know that much. Now, a couple of other facts. The Supreme Court ruled in that case seven to one. Seven to one. What's wrong with that number? Not nine. It adds up to eight. So one justice did not participate. Now, we know that in the Constitution it says we must have nine justices on the court, right? Right? Wrong. The, the Constitution says nothing about how many justices there are. That's left to Congress to decide. And then you can understand why that would happen, because in order to create the court system, they talk about the superior and inferior courts in the federal system. How many states were there to begin with? 13. Now we have 50. We have all kinds of circuits, et cetera, et cetera. You can't possibly anticipate, and in the growth of the country, how many courts you would need. You'd be continually modifying the Constitution. So seven to one. Though, If you looked at the resumes of the people who were in the majority and the people and the only dissenter, you would conclude that the guy who wrote the majority decision should have ended up on the other side, and the dissenter should have been writing the majority opinion. So I want you to know their names, because that's important to the story. And I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not a legal historian. I am a storyteller. And so the way I came at the Plessy story, which has been told by lawyers and constitutional scholars, was as a storyteller. I want you to, to know about, I wanted, I wanted to know. I, didn't know. I knew nothing about the Plessy case. I wanted to know about the people behind the case. Now, you might ask me, why did I write this book? I mean, what's the color of my skin? Let's talk about the white elephant in the room. Why did I write this story? Well, I've been in journalism now for 40 years, and I frequently have edited or written stories in which race was a component of the story in some way, either directly or indirectly. And I felt in about 2012, when I started working on this, that I did not understand the roots of our racial divide. And we do have a racial divide in America, in my opinion. Things are always getting better, but as I've learned, it's often two steps forward and one step back, particularly when it comes with the Supreme Court. No Supreme Court decision doesn't come without opposition. And there's a good reason for that, I think. Does the Supreme Court have a police force to send out if you don't pay attention to the Supreme Court's ruling? No police force. It relies on public opinion for its credibility. And it worries about public opinion, especially in the 19th century when things were, I'm going to let you in on the secret, much more divided than we are today. Because they had a civil war in 1861. That's real division. We don't have yet a civil war. So the Supreme Court in, in the 19th century is very different than the Supreme Court today. And I want you to think about that as you listen to the story, because it's really, really important to understand how different it is. Now, there's some obvious differences. I, I don't think there were any justices whose names were Sotomayor, or Ginsburg, or Kagan, or even Thomas. But that's not the main difference. The main difference is, is that how the court operated. When I hear about the Supreme Court today, if I hear on the radio, the Supreme Court is about to rule in a case, I probably think the same thing you do. 5-4. Five, 5-4. Four. Five, four. The court is that divided. So how's the court going to rule? Is, are the conservative faction, are they going to be in the ascendancy or the liberal faction? Is it going to be a, down to one swing vote? Anthony Kennedy, for many years, was a swing vote. Forget about all that in the 19th century. In the 1890s, in the 1890s, the Supreme Court had some terms. A term lasts from October to June. Guess how many 5-4 decisions they had in some of those terms? Zero. 6-3, zero. Usually 7-2, 8-1, and only in 10% of the cases. 90% of the time, the Supreme Court was unanimous. Unanimous. They were not unanimous in Plessy. They were not unanimous in any of the civil rights cases that followed the Civil War. Now, why do I say the civil rights cases that followed the Civil War? Because there were essentially, there's a couple, there were essentially no civil rights cases before the Civil War because there was no civil rights laws and civil rights legislation. 
the, the civil rights cases often come out of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution, which all come after the Civil War. So I'm sure you guys all know the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments, but I'm going to give you a little capsule summary in one sentence of each. So the 13th amendment abolishes slavery, also bans badges of servitude except if you've been convicted of a crime. In other words, you can't be pressed into convict labor. That did happen, though, to many people of color after the Civil War. The 14th Amendment does three important things. It gives citizenship rights to people of color, to black people. It um, gives due process, and it gives equal protection. And that's the phrase that is often at issue in many civil rights cases. What is equal protection? The state shall make no laws abridging the rights of its citizens, equal protection under the law. The 15th gives voting rights. It enfranchises black men. Black men, not black women, not any woman, black men. But those three, those three amendments are a revolution. Because when you think about the original Constitution, where the word slavery does not appear, but it's embedded in there because it talks about the three-fifths of a person, the compromise between North and South, to give the South greater representation. So that's enough facts, facts about that. Let me go back to talking about race and my view of it. So Black History Month is February. There's a good reason why Black History Month was created, because for a long time, there was no history about people who were black. But today, for this guy at least, this is not black history, the Plessy case. Civil rights cases are not black history. This is our history. It's everybody's history. And we're never going to bridge our racial divide unless we understand different points of view. Not all white people think the same thing. Not all people of color think the same thing. It's a very diverse country. But we, we can't have separate histories. We can't have people of color writing black history, people who are white writing white history, although that's the way it was for a long time. So I wanted to engage myself in this history. And the way I wanted to go at the story was by developing a double narrative. Because when you have a legal case, yeah, you got the people who are the lawyers who argue the case. And you have the justices who decide the case. And in the 19th century, they're all white. But the other part of the, of the equation are the people who bring the cases, who cause the cases to exist. And those are the people I call the resistors to racial separation, the resistors to racial separation. They are people like Frederick Douglass in 1840 in the North, in Massachusetts, who refuses to be uh, sent to the Jim Crow car on a Massachusetts railroad train. Now think about that. You would have thought that separation is a Southern problem, a Southern problem, but it's not. The birth of separation is in the North at the dawn of the railroad age, because there's nothing like a railroad to throw together a mass of people and ask them to ask the question, where do I sit? That didn't happen when you were riding alone on horseback. It didn't happen very much when you were in a stagecoach. But when the eight passenger railroads in Massachusetts opened for business in the 1840s, Five of them did not separate their passengers. Three of them did. So immediately, like all things in America, you have a division. What are these three railroads doing separating their passengers? What, why would that happen? Well, one obviously is racism, but another is economic. They think they're white passengers wanted, and the white passengers are the bulk of the passengers. And yet, and yet, this historian went and looked at the 1840 census in Massachusetts for the state of Massachusetts. And guess how many people of color there were in Massachusetts in 1840? 700 people? Fewer than 1% of the population. I actually don't know the exact absolute number. It's, it's larger than 700. But 1% of the population. And guess where they weren't? They weren't on the railroads. So there was no point to this separation except for establishing the idea that people of color, people who are white, are not going to be intermingling. So the, Frederick Douglass was the newest agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, the newest agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. They are the abolitionists. That's what we call them now, led by a guy named William Lloyd Garrison. How many people here know that name? William Lloyd Garrison, the most radical of the radical abolitionists. 
And they loved Douglas because they heard him speak and he was so eloquent. And so they hired him. He was in his early 20s. And the abolitionists were the best customers of these new railroads because they were going to, just like community organizers today, they're, they're going to go to their night meetings. They're not going to go on horseback and stagecoach if they can go on the new lumbering, smelly railroad uh, you know, with a locomotive that's throwing fumes back at the, in the cars. They're going to go you know, with, with this uh, protected uh, car. But Douglas is traveling with a white abolitionist. So they're trouble. They're trouble to these conductors. They're going north from Boston to Salem, Salem, the witch trials, south from Boston to New Bedford, New Bedford, the whaling industry. And they're having a ball because abolitionists want to create trouble. They want to force an issue. And so Douglas makes uh, the conductor eject him. He describes this in his memoir very colorfully. He's a big, broad-shouldered guy. He grabs onto the seat, and he grips it so tightly that six men are required to oust him. And when they oust him, up comes the seat off of the bolts on the floor. That's how strong Douglas said he was. All right, can I confirm that? No. So I'm just going to tell it to you. But uh, there was another guy riding the railroads at the same time, another black abolitionist, and his name was David Ruggles. Anybody know the name David Ruggles? He was from New York. He was visiting Massachusetts. He was not a broad-shouldered guy. He was slight, he was small, and he was going blind from early cataracts at the age of 33. And when the conductor and crew ejected him from the New Bedford line, leaving him battered and bruised, clo clothing torn, Ruggles did something different than Mr. Douglas. He went into the New Bedford police court, and he filed a lawsuit. And that is the first lawsuit about public transportation and racial separation that I could find in the United States. So there's a line that you can draw from David Ruggles to Homer Plessy in 1896 in New Orleans. That line includes William Howard Day right here in Michigan, who when he was told that he could not buy an indoor cabin to protect himself and his wife from the weather on the Detroit River on a steamboat, he left the steamboat and he sued and took his case to the Michigan Supreme Court in 1855. He lost. It includes Mary Miles, a teacher in Philadelphia, who also had the same experience on the Westchester and Philadelphia Railroad in 1867. She sued and went to the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania and lost. It includes William Nichols in New Orleans, who refused to ride the streetcars pulled by mules pulled by mules, didn't go very fast. They had star cars for the colored passengers, star cars. Nichols said, I'm not riding the star car today. I'm going to go across town on the white car. But his real destination was jail, and that's where he went. Two weeks later, the mayor convinced the streetcars of New Orleans to get rid of the star cars. It includes Mary Miles. I'm sorry, I never talked to my mother. It includes Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells, the famous black journalist later on, her campaign against lynching. But when she was 20 years old in Memphis, Tennessee, she twice sued the railroads for ejecting her from the white car. And then we get to Homer Plessy in New Orleans. And one of the parts of this story in, in, in separate is the, is the city of New Orleans, which is a city unlike any in the country. It, it was like, unlike any in the country then and unlike any in the country, I would say, now. So when people ask me, why did you write this book, and I don't tell them what I told you earlier, I tell them, because who doesn't want to go to New Orleans to work on a book? New Orleans is a great place to go. But New Orleans has a, a, a three-tiered society in the 19th century. A three, it sort of still has that today, which is it was you know, run by the French and the Spanish in the, in the 18th century. And then the Americans come in 1803, and they take it over. And when the guy who is the provincial governor comes to New Orleans to, to, to you know, take his post, he discovers something that troubles him a great deal. There are 6,000 6, free people of color. And they have something that people of color don't have in the rest of the South or the North. They have guns. They have a militia. And so this guy, whose name is William Claiborne, if you've, how many people have been in New Orleans? You know Claiborne Avenue? That's William Claiborne. Claiborne writes to Jefferson, the president, 
Madison, the Secretary of State. But you know, remember, we're talking about technology here. The dawn of the railroad age was just as much of a technological revolution as the computer and the cell phone. But Claiborne doesn't have a telegraph yet. He just has letters. And he sends his letter to New Orleans, I mean, from New Orleans to, to Washington. It goes by boat around Florida and up the coast. It takes a month for his letter to arrive. It takes another month for the reply to come back. And in asking for their advice and help, do you know what he to they told him? Sorry, buddy, you're on your own. So he got two months. Two months went by, and he, didn't, he hadn't done anything yet. And so they told him he had to just muddle through, and that's kind of what he did. He did not disband the militias. He let them keep their weapons, which was a good thing. Because in 1814-15, when Andrew Jackson said, you know, I need, I need a little more manpower to fight the British in the Battle of New Orleans, guess who he recruited? Two battalions of the free people of color, immigrants and native-born. They were separated by that. And they fought in that battle, and then they asked for their rights. They wanted to be removed from the sandwich layer that these free people of color, they existed between the whites and the enslaved population. They could own property, but they couldn't hold office. They couldn't vote. And they wanted to have full participation of their civil rights. And they kept pressing for this and pressing for it, and it didn't happen. And then after the Civil War, this mixed race, largely French-speaking group became pushed toward being black again. And they didn't like that very much. So by 1890, when the Louisiana legislature passes a law, they decide to take action. So that's a lot of facts, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna now play, I'm gonna switch from being Steve Luxembourg. I'm now gonna be Alex Trebek. We're gonna play Jeopardy, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a quiz so we can all talk about this together. So this is Plessy for 100, all right? There are no right, right, right or wrong answers. You're gonna, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to participate here. Shout out what you think. It's not easy to write Jeopardy answers, I, I discovered. OK. Here's, what, you know, the, here's the board. Plessy for 100. Ding. This Louisiana law was violated. This Louisiana law was violated when Homer Plessy sat in the car reserved for white passengers. So what's the Louisiana law? What do you think it was called? The Separate Car Act, which for the comfort of the passengers, the white passengers, for the comfort of the passengers, the railroad was required, <coughs> required, not advised, required to provide equal but separate accommodations for its white and colored passengers. Equal but separate. Not separate but equal. Equal but separate. Think about why that might have been the way it was phrased. OK, Plessy for 200. The lawyers for Plessy asked for Plessy's help because of this notable aspect of his identity. He looked very white. Ding. You want to you come up here? I'll give you $200 in front of you. He looked nearly white. And part of their legal strategy was they weren't looking to help out people who were nearly white, although you could make that argument. They were looking to defeat the law. And the law said that the white and colored passengers sh should be separate. But there was no definition in Louisiana for the word colored. So who's a person of color? And they wanted to argue that if the conductor, who has been nominated as judge, jury, and prosecutor here, is walking down the aisle of a railroad train, and he looks at you, and he says, you, into the other car. And you say, but, 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 but I'm, I'm not. How could the conductor know without taking testimony, without having evidence, without finding the records of the person's birth and their parentage? It was a violation of due process. They wanted to argue. So this was the kind of volunteer they needed. Homer Plessy was a volunteer to get arrested. And he was, he was chosen in part because he looked nearly white. Or he looked, he looked white. You could pass for white. All right. So this, this man is ahead, so you want to catch up to him. Plessy for 300. The people behind the Plessy case took this unusual step to give themselves the best conditions, the best situation to argue their case before the Supreme Court. What did they want to create? If you're a lawyer looking to create the best conditions, 
you want to make sure that if you're trying to defeat a law, that you get arrested under that law. And they were afraid if they just sent Plessy or anybody else onto the train and he put up a fuss, the conductor would eject him and then he would get charged, with, if he got charged with anything, disorderly conduct. Or he wouldn't be charged at all, and that would be of no help. So they wanted to make sure that he was charged under the separate car act that was Plessy for 100. And they also wanted to make sure that, um, and in order to make sure that he was arrested, they hired their own detective. And what I was looking for was, the unusual step was, they asked the railroad to be in on it. They asked the railroad, they went to the railroad, they said, this is what we want to do. We're going to have a private detective waiting in the wings. We want your conductor to have a conversation, and then we want to arrest him and let the private detective write the arrest, write out the report. So he, got the, so he would put into his report, this is the law that is being violated. Because they weren't going to the Supreme Court to talk about disorderly conduct. So they wanted to create those conditions. So why do you think the railroad would want to be in on it? Why, they, they, would, they wanted to be in on it because, hey, tell us whether we're supposed to run two cars or one. We'll do whatever you want. But we, we want to get this settled. It's an economic is, issue for us. OK, Plessy for 400. Seven justices upheld the Louisiana law, seven justices. And six shared this important bond, as Alex would say, this important bond. What's the, what's the thing that they shared among themselves, these seven justices? I'm sorry? Slaveholders? No, they, slaveholders. They're you, all Southern. They're all Southern. You guys are setting me up so well here. <laughs> they were all but one Northern. Six out of the seven justices shared their northern heritage. So when we think about the Plessy case, not only do we have racial separation beginning in the north, we have seven, six justices from the north deciding this case in favor of the south separating its passengers. So think about that. Why would six, not why, but the fact that six justices from the north, those all nine white men, all interested in property rights, why would they favor that? Plessy for 500. You're still ahead. When the Plessy ruling was announced, the only dissenter predicted that it would become as infamous as what previous Supreme Court case? Dred Scott. Dred Scott. Ding. You, go, you won. All right. <laughs> Here's your gift. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jackie. All right, so um, John Marshall Harlan, who was a slaveholder's son, who was the owner of slaves, who had opposed those three civil rights amendments when he, when he was Kentucky Attorney General after the war, but who contradictorily fought for the Union Army. He's the guy I was talking about when I said, look at their resumes. He's the dissenter in this case, because by the 1870s, 1877 is when he's nominated to the court, he's become a fervent advocate for civil rights. He's the dissenter in all of the civil rights cases of the late 19th century. And in 1896, his dissent in Plessy, he said, this case will be as infamous as Dred Scott. He liked to pick on Dred Scott. He thought that that was what the court's worst moment. Dred Scott, for those of you who may not remember every word of it, is the case that says that people of color, black people, can never be citizens of the United States which is, of course, overturned not by another Supreme Court case, but by the 14th Amendment, which gives citizen rights, citizen rights to blacks. OK. And now the, the Daily Double, because you got to have a Daily Double if we're playing Jeopardy. The majority ruling in Plessy is famous for three words, which do not appear anywhere in the majority opinion. What are those three words? Separate but equal. So you didn't, I didn't ask you what you were betting, so I guess you went ahead of him. <laughs> I'm awarding you. Okay. So those three words did not appear in the decision. So how do we get to this Plessy case being called separate but equal if the court didn't even use those words? So one of the things that I did when I started researching the story is I set up a Google alert, because even though I'm 67 years old, I do know how to use technology. And I had it bring me everything Plessy. And I noticed a pattern, which is that my journalistic brethren liked to say, 
the following about the Plessy case. Now, frequently, journalists have to refer to something in order to make a point, right? So if, if someone says, like a John Harlan, for example, but some politician says, oh, this is as bad as Plessy, this is as bad as separate but equal, to help you out as readers, I would see this sentence. The Supreme Court created the doctrine of separate but equal in the Plessy case and made it the law of the land. Sound familiar? We kind of agree that that's what it did, right? I don't like that, sit that sentence. Let's, let's parse these words and see why. Did the, now, you heard what I said earlier, right? You were all paying attention. Did the Supreme Court create a doctrine of separate but equal? No. I mean, if it did create a doctrine, I would like you to show me in the opinion where the doctrine is where they don't even use the word separate but equal. But they also didn't create it. It was created by the Massachusetts railroads and their passengers back in the 1840s. So what they did, and there often is sentences that say this too, they upheld the doctrine, if it was a doctrine at all. They upheld the custom of separate but equal. Did they make it the law of the land? I don't think so. Does the Supreme Court make laws? No. Who makes laws? Congress makes laws. All right, so it's a shorthand. They make laws. It means it became widespread. But that's not how the case was decided. The majority rejected, it rejected the 13th and 14th Amendment as arguments by the Plessy team. And instead, it, f it decided the case on the basis of what is essentially the 10th Amendment, which reserves all rights to the states that are not, not expressly given to Congress or the federal government. And it said that under that uh, states' rights authority, Louisiana had the responsibility and power to enact, under its police powers, legislation that would keep peace and quiet, law and order, harmony with the races, and it was better to separate them. That's the basis on which they decided it. And they said that because it was equal but separate, it was OK because it treated both parts of the equation the same. That's on the basis. That's how they decided it. Well, in order to get Jim Crow throughout the South and some of the North, other states had to pass legislation. They did not make any ruling that said, OK, that's the way it is, guys. So all the states had to pass their own legislation that permitted or didn't permit certain kinds of racial discrimination. So you might say, OK, so now we've parsed the words. Steve, why are you making a fuss about this? Why are you making this point? Here's my real point. It blames the Supreme Court and lets the rest of us off the hook. Oh, it's the Supreme Court's fault. They created separate but equal. No, we created separate but equal. Separate but equal, racial separation, racial discrimination, racial prejudice is the shame of the South, it's the shame of the North, it's the shame of the country. And until we recognize that fact, we cannot bridge our racial divide. So that's why I care about that, that, uh, that sentence. So I'm going to end, and then I'm going to take questions, not end, but I'm going to complete my talk by reading to you two things. First, I want to read you the last paragraphs of my prologue so you really know what I'm trying to accomplish in this book. And I want to show up my writing, writing a little bit, too. <laughs> All Supreme Court cases have their own geography. Remarkable characters populate this one. Albion Terje, the, lawyers for, the lawyer, main lawyer for Plessy, of Ohio. Brown of New England and Michigan. Henry Billings Brown, who wrote the majority of the decision, of New England and Michigan. John Marshall Harlan of Kentucky, Louis Martinet of, Lu of, of uh, Louisiana, the head of the committee that brought the case. On separate paths to a shared destination, connected by time, culture, happenstance, and the unresolved struggle between an exhausted North and a bitter South, still fighting the Civil War. Their actions and attitudes, their flaws and foibles, who they were, where they lived, what they said, why they said it, how their views evolved during a tumultuous half century of strife and conflict, serve as powerful reminders that history is made and not ordained. And I want to close with somebody else's words. Um, usually writers don't like to break the frame, I say it that way, the break the frame of their story. The frame of my story is the 19th century into the 
20th century when the, I close out the careers of all of the major characters in the book. So that's about 1915. But I, I use a quote between the prologue and the first chapter from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because when I came across it, I was so taken by it that I thought he had summed up so well where we were in, eight, in 1957 when he said it. And you could argue, still pertinent today. Men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they can't communicate with each other. They can't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. Thank you for listening. Let's have a discussion and conversation. This program was recorded on November 6th, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.